Right, so this is the Dingu A330, which has been bought from www.ankarka.com. It's the actual successor by Dingu Technologies to the A320. It's uh, been styled slightly different, more akin to a PSP. It's got a slightly brighter screen. It's got about the same kind of form factor as an iPhone or um, a DS kind of folded in half, but it is much, much lighter uh, and much thinner, obviously. Um, in terms of functionality, you've got your standard kind of D-pad, select and start buttons, YXBA, LR, just as you would have on a SNES pad or a PSP. No additional function buttons, no actual volume buttons, but there is software volume and you've got a standard power switch on here to the side. Um, a lot of people have been wondering how good this machine is at emulating. Let's face it, basically that's what everyone is buying it for. It's um, This come to roughly in British pounds about 70 odd pounds to import to the UK. Um, it comes with 4 gigabyte internal flash and I've upgraded it with an 8 gigabyte SDHC card. It takes mini SD profile. Um, I've got a micro SD in there with a mini SD adapter. Um, it's been installed with, uh, it's got the standard operating system, but Dingux has also been installed, which is the Linux build for the Dingo. Um, and I've set it up so it boots straight into Dingus from the off. So we'll fire it up and take a look at a few of the features. You can see Dingux just loud in there. You can set it up as a dual boot, dual boot operation where it loads into the standard firmware first and you press select to boot to Dingux, but because Dingux has got the better emulators I'll set it up to boot into Dingux first. Um, I used a combination of different local packs, upgraded packages to take advantage of the 64 megabytes of RAM that the A330's got. Um, and I've stripped it down to basically all the emulators that I want. There are a lot more available, but these kind of show how they compare to the standard um, native operating system emulators. And here, uh, I'll just take you through a couple of them. All right, we'll start with 8 bit. We've got NES, pretty standard fare. You can see it, this one boots by basically using uh, the inbuilt D menu system uh, to find a game to select. We'll go to standard favourite, standard Super Mario Brothers. Press B, you can see it fire up. Um, I think I've got the volume pretty low for most of these, so you'll have to excuse if you can't hear any of them. But you should be able to get a fear for how smooth the emulators run. So, here we go. You see, there's no major lag, there's no major delays or anything. Plays the game's just fine. Emulate them just as they would. Pretty much what you'd expect to see from a Pentium 3 PC in terms of emulating power, I would say. Um, Linux, obviously, a very lightweight operating system anyway. Optimized to use the mobile processor that's inside these. But anyway, that's NES. Pretty standard fare. Um, different ways to get out of different emulators. This one as you can see it was hold select and press the shoulder buttons and um, we'll just go back to the standard menu. Just goes back to the standard menu there. Um, does handhelds pretty well. We'll fire up Game Boys to show you. See, it's got the grayscale effect of the original Game Boy. Again, frame rate is high, and um, one good feature is many of the emulators come with an underclocking or overclocking feature, and 
some of the more lightweight emulators like the 8 bits can be underclocked to save your battery life. Handy for, especially in some platforms like the game where we've got such great games on them anyway. You can see that running just fine. So we'll come out of that. Um, as you can see there's a volume function just there. That's because there is no hardware volume, it has to be done in software. But you can adjust things like frame skip if you needed to, which you don't. Save states and everything are available. You can go to full screen stretch, aspect full screen, whatever you need to. Pretty standard for air across the emulators. And as we go up into the 16 bit territory, we've got the Mega Drive. The native Mega Drive emulator is okay. There is a better one available, but to really get the most out of it, you're better off going for um, one of the Dingux builds of Pico Drive. And we'll go to Sonic 2, one of my favourites. Piece, pretty standard 16 bit affair. As you can see, loads, runs just fine. No major slowdown. Run at 60 frames per second. NTSC. I've got this on full screen stretch because it's pretty much the same as it would be if it was an aspect anyway. All the effects are there, all the layer effects, the speed, all your standard controls like start, pause, whatever. Run just great. Compatibility with 16 bit consoles is very high. Only one or two games might not run. There you go, you can see the Pico, Pico Drive menu there. That also supports Mega CD if you wanted to run that. Right. Now we're going to the bit more demanding territory. We'll have a look at uh, SNES. Now the standard SNES build, standard SNES emulator on the native operating system isn't fantastic. There is a better one of Pocket SNES which runs things fantastic but uh, the SNES 9X port to Dingux is brilliant. So we'll go into that. Compatibility is high, not perfect. Some of the ones with more advanced uh, hardware protection or specialist chips like the Super FX or some of the Mode 7 games will struggle but 90% of the games will run great. We'll go to a token game like Mario World. As you can see it fires up just fine. Load times are very short. All the layers are there which you don't get on some mobile emulators for SNES. And then you can see it runs just fine. Fully playable. Doesn't suffer from the YMB problem that the A320 did, where you couldn't press YMB at the same time, which of course is a problem if you want to do things like running jumps and things like that. Got to admit, the D pad and the buttons themselves did take a little bit of breaking in. They feel very plasticky to start with, a bit sticky. Um, Almost like the catching, but I'd imagine that's just a moulding issue. Um, been playing it now for about two weeks. It soon breaks in, they become less squeaky and clicky. Feel more like uh, a PSP would, as you'd expect from any handheld console. Anyway, we'll go back. I'll show you what some of the issues are. If we go to Mario Kart, Mario Kart, of course, uses. Um, mode 7 for main gameplay occasionally it'll hang so I'm just curious to see now it is working it is firing up it's going through the menu system just fine now I have got this set to be fixed frame skip number 2 or I did have if I go back to the menu and change that it's on full screen, but some games it's better to run a fixed frame skip rather than a automatic frame skip. That way you do get slightly a slight bit of frame skipping, but the game will run much smoother and consistent rather than jumping about between high frame skip and low frame skip. 
runs a tad slow, but it is playable. Frame skipper 3 or 4 would probably help, but would probably be a little bit of a blur, but it is playable. And uh, upcoming releases might play it slightly better. The native emulator doesn't play Mario Kart, so this is quite an achievement. Um, plays okay, it handles the Mode 7 graphics well. All round, pretty good emulator. Everything else, your standard 2D affairs will play just fine. Your Street Fighters, things like that. Don't try and run Star Fox, it'll lock up the system. Um, but all your kind of um, RPGs, favourite games like that will all run. Right, stepping up, you can see I've got a few more platforms there, but they're pretty standard affair. Master System runs great, PC Engine, Game Gear, Neo Geo Pocket, they all run absolutely fine with no problems. Game Boy Advance runs very well, some of the more demanding 3D titles and there won't work, like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, but most of the Mode 7 stuff will, so your Mario Karts and F-Zeros. In terms of arcade emulation, you've got a port of MAME, um, but for 90% of the games, you've got your CPS 1 and 2 and your Neo Geo, some Konami games. Final Burn Alpha runs a lot of those a lot better without overclocking. That's quite good because it'll make your battery last longer. If we just quickly have take a look at MAME. A few minutes, there you go. It's got its own obviously ROM system. It uses the 0.37 B5 ROM set which is what all mobile platforms use. And if we go to... let's just think... let's have a look at... if we go to Final Fight let's say. It's a good comparison because we can see how it runs on Final Burn Alpha as well. Right. So Final Fight, you can see on there, I've actually overclocked this to run at 420 megahertz, which is about the peak of what you can overclock to. The standard is 336 megahertz. When that loads up. See, it runs fairly well in the menus and everything. Once it gets into the game, it's a tad slower than the arcade would be or what, or how Final Burn Alpha would run it. it. Runs perfectly well. Animation's good. You can't, well, you can manually adjust the frame skip, but it can be a bit of a pain. It's better just to adjust the dingo clock. But this is taking it up to 420 megahertz to run well. We come out of that. Um, it does run many of the classic games better. A lot of your early '80s stuff and things like that will run, will run a lot better than that does. If we come out of that and take it to Final Burn Alpha now, I've got to admit I was a little bit disappointed the first time I saw Main because it doesn't run as well as it does on a PSP. But then when I discovered how well Final Burn runs, that I was very impressed with. If I go to Final Fight on here, this of course uses the more modern version of the ROMs. It's only clocking at 336 MHz. Um, and you'll see how well this performs. See already the boot sequence is a lot quicker. Text animation is a lot quicker. Add some credits. It's actually in its original aspect ratio, not overstretched. You should be able to see at this point that it is running a little bit faster than MAME does. A bit smoother, and it's, this is only running at the native uh, clock speed of 336 MHz, which is much more efficient for your battery and it means that those more demanding games can be overclocked if needs be but so far even the more demanding Neo Geo games and everything don't require um, overclocking to run at 
pretty much full speed with no frame skip. If I go back, we'll have a some, look at something a touch larger. Um, I'm pretty sure the Metal Slug games run well, so let's just go to that. I have got that overclocked to 420 megahertz. Uh, that one doesn't run, but let's try. Yeah, Metal Slug One. See what happens with this. I haven't fully tested all the ROMs. It is a complete ROM set, but I will strip it down once I discover what's working and what's not. There you go. You can see the Neo Geo logo coming up. That loaded that fairly quick, which for Neo Geo ROM, as you know, is pretty good. You should now be able to see the kind of speed you'll be looking at. So this is on 420 megahertz, and it's running Metal Slug pretty well. It's actually a bit lot smoother in reality than it actually looks on this this recording. Pull it a touch closer. Hopefully, it will improve the way it animates. I know a lot of people favour these type of games, the Neo Geo games. So that's good news for all those type of fans. Right. Now, some games when you do step out on Final Burn, do step out, but that's a good opportunity for me to take you to the native firmware to show you what the native firmware can do. We press and select as it boots up, it will go into the native firmware. You've got the pretty much standard things that you'd expect from a mobile media player. You've got your music. If I go into that, it's just plays daft things there. Silly things not really interested in. I've got some music tracks on there somewhere but I can't bother to look at them. If we go to the movie theatre I've quickly dropped on an episode of Family Guy. Great thing about the dingo is it doesn't need um, file format conversion which is one thing that takes it superior to things like PSP. This is just a standard AVI file not been shrunken down, it's not been converted to another format, it's not been converted to another file size. That is running perfectly well. And with the controls. Go back. That's the menu. You've got a radio on there, if that's your type of thing, reception will vary. Um, voice recorder, you'll rarely use that. Picture viewer, why would you bother when you've got a, an iPhone? But, you know, there you go, it's got that if you want to do it. Um, E-reader, which is handy if you like to read books. Now, a good thing about the Dingu is it has got a native TV out function. This is great because it means you can play most of the emulators um, and all the videos and everything just by plugging them into standard RCA out inputs on your TV. Uh, and playing those directly, you switch it to the TV you want, you can choose between PAL or NTSC. You've got a file browser and of course you've got your settings, you can change the backlight time. I've set the backlight time to short which is why you see it keep seeing it go off. Just saves your battery life if you're not paying attention. But if we go back to the games, unfortunately you've got a bad English conversion and we've got 3D game and interesting game. Basically, interesting game is all your emulators, that's all you need to know. It's running the 1.2 version of the software, like the later builds of the A320. We'll just go into that and have a quick look at these. It does do CPS 1 and 2 very well using its inbuilt native emulators. We'll just have a quick look there at, let's see. More popular CPS games, we go to Street Fighter. Let's give that a chance to boot up. Good thing is you just drag and drop your ROMs on with the native emulators and all you do is pick your game and off you go. There's no settings to mess with or anything. Same story. Oops, different controls for this. Let's just press select to add your coins. As you can see, 
playing Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo. Perfectly well. A little bit of a uh, layering glitch in there. Can happen on some games, but it's quite rare. I've not seen it on any other stage apart from this one. As you can see, that runs perfectly well. I'm not playing it too well because the angle it's being played at. But um, it does play very well. The animation's great. But anyway, let's uh, come out of that. Let's go back to the menu. For CPS1, I'll show you um, Game Boy Advance. This is one of the... Oh, actually, I don't have any ROMs on there for that. But it is one of the better, than native, better of the native emulators. A couple more people have created for the native emulators. We've got Game Gear, Game Boy. Neo Geo support is okay, but not fantastic. But it will play some of the later games. If we'll just go to SNK vs Capcom, which is one of the later Neo Geo games. See, it takes a while to boot, but it does indeed work. Rack up some credits. SNK versus Capcom, of course. One of the better collaboration between Capcom and SNK. A lot of the versus fighting for series collaborations. A lot of people are interested in these type of games, so it's good to know that they do run well. As you can see, there's no speed loss or anything on these. They play brilliantly. Again, you can configure your controls as you see fit. Now, we'll have a quick look at the native, native Mega Drive emulator. This is an upgraded native Mega Drive emulator because the native Mega Drive emulator was a touch weak. But it does run it very well and shows the system is very capable. Um, if we just boot up Alien Storm, you'll see it's a lot smoother than the Dingux one. Anyone who's used these before will know that this is already smoother than the, the standard native uh, Mega Drive emulator. But it is also a touch slower. I think this is running at more like PAL speed rather than the NTSC speed. But it is very smooth, very playable, emulated very well. The screen is nice and bright, you can change the brightness if you want to. Probably being drowned out to touch by the lighting in this room, but very usable, very playable. Step out of that again. You can adjust the frame skip, adjust the button settings if you want to, but there should be no real need. So, you can navigate to the mini SD card or the standard onboard memory um, in order to access ROMs or access native emulators that launch from a different command line. Um, but like I say, if you install Dingux, you get the best of both worlds. There are also some ports of PC games like Doom, which run very well. There's lots of app there's lots of applications and everything for it. All round, it's a fantastic machine. Anyone who wants an emulation device and has tried other systems like I have, I've tried iPhone, I've tried PSP, I've read about various things about Wiz and the other Dingus. But it is a fantastic machine. I'm very happy with it. I think it's definitely worth the money. It might be worth teaming up with people to bring your shipping costs down. But it's a very lightweight, very pocket-friendly machine. And uh, if I had to rate it, I would give it an 8 out of 10. And I will definitely be procuring some more for my um, my young nephew and some friends and hopefully some uh, some customers of mine